morning, everyone, and welcome to our last online worship service for Hailthorpe Community Church as we are reopening our doors next Sunday, March the 7th, for our 11 a.m. worship service. We cannot wait to see you all again. See if anybody maybe picked up some new stylish masks over the past couple weeks. We'll have hand sanitizer available upon entry, and we are just so excited to see you as we really begin the month of March and move closer to Easter, which is the first Sunday in April. So we want to also let you know that on Palm Sunday will be our Easter musical, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, and then our Good Friday service will be at 7 p.m. on April 2nd. We are just so excited to see everyone again, and we're going to go ahead and open us up in a word of prayer, and then we're going to have some worship together, all right? Father God, we thank you so much for this day where we could gather together virtually and worship you. We thank you for the technology to be able to do this, and Father, we just ask that you would just bless our time of worship as we just, uh, as we sing to you, Father. Father, you are so worthy of our praise. May everything that we do bring honor and glory to your name. We ask it all in your name. Amen. Amen. All right, well, let's go ahead and have our time of worship together. Good morning, church. We're so glad that you joined us today for Church Online. Let's go ahead and worship together and sing this first song, Glorious Day. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my soul Till I met you I was breathing but not All my failures I try to hide It was my sin Till I met you You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the dark to your glorious day You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day My soul Oh, and now your freedom is all that I know Oh, the old made new Jesus, when I met you Oh, what a day when you called my name And I ran out of that grave darkness into your glorious death you called my name and I ran out of that prayer out of the darkness into your glorious death Rest. My sin was heavy, the chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was a north. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open. When you called my 
is one that is probably very familiar to everyone. It's called Jesus Paid It All, and it's a hymn. It's a great hymn. It's one of my favorites. Um, so let's go ahead and sing this together, Jesus Paid It All.
sacrifice you paid for our sins on the cross. We thank you that you were willing to do that for us, and we, we thank you for that. We pray for Pastor Stephen as he delivers the message. We pray that we would hear what you want us to hear out of it, and that you would open our hearts to receive what you have to say. And we pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning again. Wasn't that just a wonderful time of worship? I love that song, Jesus Paid It All. What a great song that we were singing this morning. So, of course, I want to start off with a joke this morning, and I have to do my part to keep up with Pastor Frank when he tells his joke. So here's mine. Mr. Green peered over his fence one morning and noticed that the neighbor's little boy was in his backyard filling a hole. Curious about what the youngster was up to, Mr. Green asked, Jimmy, what are you doing? Tearfully, little Jimmy replied, my goldfish died and I've just buried him. Well, that's an awfully large hole for a goldfish, isn't it? Mr. Green asked, patting down the last bit of earth. Little Jimmy replied, well, that's because he's in your cat. (laughs) Well, there's our joke for the day. But this morning, we are going to talk about unity and be, the, today's message is called One in Heart and Mind. And we're going to be digging into the book of Acts together, chapter 4, verses 32 through 35. And the Bible says, All the believers were united in heart and mind, and they felt that what they owned was not their own. So they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's great blessing was upon them all. There were no needy people among them because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. Father, we ask uh, just your blessing upon today's service as we dig into your word, as we unpack this word unity and being one in heart and one in mind. Father, I pray that every single word that comes out of my mouth would be your words and that you would fill me with your words so we can hear from you this morning. And we ask this all in your name. Amen. All right, so we're in, again, we're in the book of Acts this morning, and we're talking about the early church and some of the characteristics that the early church had. You see, the early church, they were able to share their possessions and property with each other because of something big, and that was unity. We've heard unity used in a lot of different ways. People define it in many different ways. We're going to break it down for you, and I want to unpack that this morning. They had unity, and it was because of that unity that was brought by the Holy Spirit working in and through the lives of the believers. Some people might mistake this communal living arrangement for principles that can be found in something, well, that doesn't sound as good as unity, And that's known as communism. Before we dig too much further in this morning, I want to give you a quick refresher on the early church. And we find about the early church in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. And the Bible says, All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and to fellowship, and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshipped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy, with generosity all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. You see, by recognizing the other believers as brothers and sisters in the family of God, the Christians in Jerusalem shared all they had so that they all could benefit from God's gifts. It's so tempting, especially if we have material wealth to cut ourselves off from one another, each taking care of his or her own interests, each providing for and enjoying his or her own little piece of the world. But as God's, well, as part of God's spiritual family, it is our responsibility to help 
one another in every single way possible. God's family works best when its members work together. There was a common misconception about the first Christians who were Jews was that they rejected the Jewish religion. But see, these believers saw Jesus' message and resurrection as the fulfillment of everything they knew and believed from the Old Testament. The Jewish believers at first, they did not separate from the rest of the Jewish community. They still went to the temple and synagogues for worship. Uh, They still took instruction in the scriptures and followed those things. But their belief in Jesus created great friction with Jews who did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. Thus, believing Jews, they were forced to meet in homes, in private homes for communion, for prayers, and for teaching about Christ. And by the end of the first century, many of these Jewish believers, they really, they were excommunicated from their synagogues. So what was the early church marked by? Well, when you really think about it, the early church, they were marked by faithful attendance as they even met together daily, as it said in verse 46 from chapter 2. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts, it says in NIV. They broke bread in the homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Their fellowship included hospitality. See, no home would be large enough for many to meet together, so they met in more and more and more different homes as they continued to grow and grow and grow. Because they practiced the presence of Jesus, their hearts were glad and they were sincere. Like the harmony of the early church, verse 47 indicates that these like-minded, unified people experience spiritual and numerical growth, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord, what did he do? He added to their number daily those who were being saved. So this morning, I want to unpack three different points on how this way of living that the early church did is different from, as I mentioned communism. The first, the sharing was voluntary. One of the most stirring indictments on the church ever penned was made, ironically, by Charles Schultz. Many of you maybe know who Charles Schultz is. Well, he penned this comic of Snoopy, our beloved Snoopy, shivering out in a snowstorm besides an empty food dish. He was looking expectantly towards the house. Lucy came out and said, go in peace, be warm and filled. And then she turned and went back into the house and slammed the door. In the last frame, you saw a confused looking Snoopy looking towards the house, shivering and hungry and utterly baffled. To make known the love of Christ, it takes more than words, it takes action. It entails results. Sharing the love of Christ with others involves sacrifice on our part. Are you annoyed by those people who, you know, try to corner you at a, on the street or at a party or in the middle of your workday to share with you? Either their failures, their faith, their complaints, whatever. It's probably because they aren't sharing at all. They may be gossiping. They may be, as we call it, dumping or unloading. They may even be exhorting, but they are not sharing. Lucy didn't share anything with poor, shivering Snoopy. She did not have to sacrifice any of her time, any of her money, any of her space, any of her heart, any of her feelings, or even her needs in order to make that speech. She didn't sacrifice anything to meet Snoopy's needs. To make the love of Christ known in a genuine way, to proclaim that love to the world accurately means we have to 
rebound Christ's sacrificial nature in our own lives. You see, how do we, so you're like, wait a minute, re- rebound, basketball terminology, Pastor Steve? Well, listen, we rebound love when we volunteer our most precious time to clean up a park, to help clean the church, to prepare to open, to serve at a work day, to serve different things. We rebound love when we donate food and clothes and funds, especially those funds that we might have spent on ourselves. You see, we can do that by taking those funds that we would have spent on ourselves. I know your tax return might have looked really good. Maybe some of you have filed your taxes already. Maybe when you got that stimulus check or something else, you wanted to spend it on yourself. You're like, you know, I haven't gotten new shoes in a while. I haven't gotten this in a while, but you felt called and led to give it to someone else who was in need. Maybe a missionary who was struggling or even the church. We're all in this together. You see, we rebound love when we give our favorite food, our we give diapers and formulas for mothers and babies in need, special goodies and you know those canned those canned goods that we have. We rebound love in even a deeper way. We rebound love when we put that cell phone away, when we close that laptop, when we turn off that TV, and we pick up a book and read it with our children. If our children have gone to bed, when we spend time with our spouse, even if it means staying up late to finish the job, we have a lot of different ways that we can rebound that love. And you see, you're like, oh, you might be thinking, okay, here's, you know, we have this rebound. It's a basketball analogy. I'm picking up on I'm not a big basketball person, Pastor, but I'm picking up on it. There are lots of different ways that we can, I'll use a different word, show his love to others. The options are endless. But we must remember, sharing is voluntary, but when we share, we share out of a heart of joy, which motivates us to show Christ's love to others. So we have sharing was voluntary, but let me take it a step further to part two this morning. It required what they felt convicted to share. Ooh, we're going from basketball terminology to the word convicted. Here we go. We're making a big jump here. This simple statement tells us something huge about these believers. They shared a deep bond that joined them both spiritually and emotionally. I want to tell you this. The text says that they were one in heart and soul. Now, listen, two Greek words, just finished Greek class not too long ago. The first one is cardia, and the other is shuk. Now, listen, I might have said that wrong, so I apologize if I did. Hopefully, my Greek professor's not watching this morning. But you see, the word cardia in Greek, from which we get cardiac or cardiology, which has to do with your heart. And the word souk, from which we get psych, psyche, psychology, which have to do with your mind, will, and emotions, heart and soul. Now, your heart is the spiritual aspect of your existence. Your heart, sometimes referred to as your spirit, is the wellspring of your being. It's the central place to which God relates to you spiritually. The heart is the core of your being. It's the unconscious, in, inarticulate part of yourself. Have you ever been somewhere, maybe a, a gas station or a grocery store, and you pass by or briefly meet a complete stranger? I love thinking about when we used to go to, I'd say we used to because we didn't go at all last year, an Oriole game or a Ravens game. I can talk about the Orioles and Ravens because I get to do it this week while Pastor Frank is not here to make a joke on them. We used to go to the Orioles games and we would be surrounded on the light rail on the way down. We're walking into the stadium, get ready to go to the game. We are surrounded with people that you're probably never going to see again. And if you do see them again, you're not going to realize that you saw them before on the light rail. Now, Think about that moment. 
where you meet a complete stranger. You briefly meet a complete stranger. Some people, it's in the line at the grocery store. You might talk to someone. And before you say a word to that person, you can sense that there is a spiritual union between the two of you. And you've both been born again by the power of God's spirit. So you don't have a dead, stony heart. You've got an alive heart. You aren't dead spiritually, but you're alive spiritually. And you connect with this person on a spiritual level. Some of you are like, where are you going with this? But listen, that's what was happening in this church. They were of one heart. There was a cardiac oneness in the depth of their personality. Their hearts beat together. They were of one heart. Heart. Now, the text also says they were of one soul. So whereas your heart is the spiritual aspect of your being, your soul is the mental, emotional aspect of your being. We're going deep today. The heart is the unconscious, spiritual part of who you are. Your soul is the conscious part of you. It's how you think, it's how you feel, it's how you decide. And there was a oneness in their psyche, in their soul. They thought the same things. Their spiritual heart rooted, mm, their heart rooted oneness, it was just bubbling up so they were one in thought. In in this church that we're reading about from Acts 2, In Acts 4, in this church, there was the most profound sense of unity that the world had ever seen. Now, the church, if you'll remember, they were made up of all different kinds of people. They were a magnificently diverse church. Different races, different languages, different nationalities, different socioeconomic backgrounds, uh, different opinions, different likes, (laughs) different dislikes. Listen, Unity does not mean uniformity, but yet they were of one heart and soul. They were all tuned to the same standard, and that standard was the standard of Jesus. Now, when we look back to our main text this morning, verse 32 of chapter 4, the second half of that verse describes the compelling proof that they were of one heart and soul. And no one said that of any of the things that belonged to him was their own. But they had everything in common. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own. But they shared everything they had. You see, what Luke's doing here is he's moving from the invisible to the visible from the unseen to the seen. In the early church, if you had a need and there was someone who could meet that need, what was mine was yours. And what was yours was mine. You see, usually when they say, when a husband and wife is getting married, the husband usually hears what's hers is hers and what's yours is hers. They just like to prepare you for that. Not not my wife, of course. You see, these people had everything in common. Now, let's talk real quick about what that does not mean. Some people look at the description of the early church and they see this as an early form of communism. People have even tried to pull from this text certain Karl Marxist ideas. You may have heard the famous statement from Karl Marx, which he used to summarize his communist philosophy, from each according to his ability to each according to his need. That was the Marxist slogan. In fact, there is a verse here in Acts that is similar to that idea, and that is Acts 11.29. And we'll pull that real quick. And I want you all, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Acts 11.29 which the Bible says, so the believers in Antioch decided to send relief to the brothers and sisters in Judea, everyone giving as much as they could. Now there's a couple of reasons we know that this was not an early form of communism. First, everyone maintained personal property rights. 
This was not an abolishment of personal property. Secondly, the selling of their possessions, remember that whole thing where I said it was voluntary? It wasn't by force. They weren't convinced to do this. They weren't coerced into it, but it was rather free. It was voluntary. The apostles were not authoritarian dictators who forced people to sell their possessions and redistribute their wealth. But rather, this was the Spirit of God moving in the hearts of the members of this church who could not imagine seeing a brother or a sister in need while they had a surplus. So they voluntarily sold their possessions. This church had a wonderful communal spirit. But a communal spirit is much different than state-enforced communism. But that expression, it's still striking. It's like, whoa, wait a minute. They had everything in common. That's something that I want you to remember. You've probably heard me say it about eight times this morning. Maybe if I go back and look at the tape, nine or ten. But they had everything in common. The phrase, that phrase means that the early church exhibited a radical form of generosity. And that radical generosity was the proof of the guiding principle that they were one in heart and one in soul. Moving to the third and final point, it was not a membership requirement in order for them to be a part of the church. You see, so many people talk about church membership all the time. And this church has this definition of it. This church has that definition. I love it when people come to our church from other churches and we hear the different methods of church membership that their past churches had. And some people have read through a book. Some people shared their testimony in a small group. Some people had a year's worth of meetings. Let me paint to you this morning a real and true picture of what church membership looks like. I want to tell you a story about a man named Bill. Bill had wild hair. He wore a t-shirt with holes in it, jeans with holes and shoes with no socks. This was his wardrobe during his four years of college. And though he was a mildly eccentric man, he was a brilliant person. He became a Christian while attending college. And across the campus was a traditional church. They wanted to develop a ministry to students, but they weren't sure how to go about doing it. One day, Bill decided to go worship there. He walked in with his wild hair, his t-shirt with holes in it, his holy jeans, and his shoes with no socks. The service had already started, and Bill started down the aisle looking for a seat, but the church was completely full. By now, people were looking a bit uncomfortable, but no one said a single word. No one offered him a seat with them. You see, Bill got closer and closer to the front of the church when he realized that there was not a single seat left in the room and nobody was going to make a seat for him. He just sat down right there on the floor. And although this was perfectly acceptable behavior at his college or the college fellowship events, this had never happened in that church before ever. By now, the people were really getting uptight, and the tension was so thick in the air. Here's Bill just sitting on the floor in the front of the church. A deacon from the church slowly made his way toward Bill. This deacon was well into his 80s, a very distinguished man with a silver gray hair and a three-piece suit, and he walked with a cane. Everyone thought, you can't blame him for what he is going to do. How could you expect a man of his age and background to understand some college kid thinking he could sit on the floor in a worship service? It took some time for the man to reach Bill, and the church had become completely silent, except for the clicking of the man's cane on the tile floor. All eyes were focused on him when the elderly deacon got next to the boy. He dropped his cane to the floor, and with great difficulty, he lowered himself and asked Bill, May I sit with you? The man sat down next to Bill and worshipped with him so that he would not be alone. 
The church of Jesus Christ needs more people to be like that deacon and to sit on the floor with more people like Bill. Church membership, my friends, it has nothing to do with social status. You, there's, no, there's no membership cards, or every time you come, you get one of those little punches where seven punches, and you get a free Slurpee at 7-Eleven if you're a Hailthorpe Community Church member. There's no membership cards. There's no gold plaque that says what your attendance is. You see, church membership, again, it's not about social status. It's not about helping plan events. It's about being the hands and feet of Jesus. The spiritual unity and generosity of these early believers attracted people to them. This organizational structure, it's not a biblical command, but it offers vital principles for us to follow. When people come in the doors of the church, when they look at us, when they look at Pastor Frank, Pastor Harold, myself, when they look at you, you know what those people should see? Jesus. They should see Jesus, not Stephen Price. They should see Jesus when they look at you. Wrapping up here, you know, Mercedes Benz. I don't know if you, anybody owns a Mercedes who's watching this morning. You see, Mercedes Benz was the company who first produced a car body design that absorbed the force of a collision on impact. One Mercedes-Benz TV commercial shows their car colliding with a cement wall during a safety test. Since then, of course, many other car companies have followed its design. Someone then asked the company spokesman why, do, why they do not enforce their patent on the Mercedes-Benz energy-absorbing car body. Well, they replied, as a matter of fact, because some things in life are too important not to share. Differences of opinion are inevitable among human personalities and can actually be quite helpful if handled well. But spiritual unity is essential. Loyalty, commitment, and love for God and his word. Because without spiritual unity, the church isn't going to survive. When I say that I think specifically of 1 Corinthians, this letter was written by Paul specifically to urge the church in Corinth towards greater unity. None of these Christians felt that what they had was their own, so they were able to give, they were able to share, eliminating poverty amongst them. They would not let a brother or sister suffer when others had plenty. It's time for a gut check this morning, church. How do you feel about your possessions? We should adopt the attitude that everything we have comes from God. And we are only stewarding what's already his. Do I love my car and my van? Yes, I do. Do I love keeping them neat? Yes. Do I freak out when something cosmetic happens to it? Not really, because I jokingly tell everybody, but I'm, in a way, I'm joking, but I'm kind of being serious. Actually, I am being serious. I'm not taking it to heaven with me. It's just a car. Probably traded in for a new one in six or seven years. It's just a van. Traded it in a few years. How do you feel about your possessions this morning? Dr. Martin Niemöller was an outstanding German pastor during the time of Adolf Hitler's reign. Niemöller was sent to prison for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Before being sent to prison, Niemöller had a 30-minute visit with Adolf Hitler. Hitler tried to persuade Niemöller to join his forces and turn from the stupidity of Christianity. For 30 minutes, they discussed philosophy and the ideology of Nazism. Now, Niemöller would not give up his living faith in Jesus. So Hitler sent him to prison. Years later, Niemöller was released from prison. He testified he had visions that haunted him. He dreamed that he saw Hitler standing before the judgment seat of God, and Niemöller was standing off to the side watching the panorama of events. In his vision, he saw Christ turn to Hitler and say, what is your excuse for all your crimes? In reply, Hitler says, no one told me the gospel. Niemöller said he wasted 30 minutes arguing philosophy with Hitler 
and he never told him about the love of Jesus Christ. This morning, may all of us say with our heart, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. May we be one in heart, one in mind, and a unified body of believers. Father God, we thank you again for this time that we can get into your word and talk about it practically. And how we need to be together. We need to be unified to serve you and to tell others about you. Father, it is my prayer this morning that all of us, that we would take that seriously and that when others see us, they would see you. We ask this all in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you again for joining us this morning. It was great to have you with us. We cannot wait to see you next Sunday, March 7th at 11 a.m. for our reopening of in-person worship services again. Have a great week. God bless you.